Hi, my name is Matthias Müller. I'm a physics researcher at NVIDIA and today I'm going to present our new paper with the title Detailed Rigid Body Simulation with Extended Position-Based Dynamics. My co-authors are Miles Mucklin, Nada Pongshentane, Stefan Jeschke and Te Yong Kim. And we're all from NVIDIA. I will start with the motivation for our work. So let's say you want to write your own rigid body engine or parts of it. If you check the literature, you will find equations like this or similar ones. I guess only a few people interested in rigid body simulation have the mathematical background to turn these into a rigid body engine. So does this mean rigid body simulation is only for math wizards? The goal of this project was to extend the position-based dynamics method to also handle rigid bodies with contacts and joints. This way, we wanted to make rigid body simulation as simple as PVD, or rigid body simulation for everyone. What's important though, is that we did not want to trade the simplicity for accuracy. For this reason, we based our method on extended position-based dynamics, or XPVD. It uses the true physical quantities like forces and torques. This way, our method is a serious alternative to existing engines. Here is the first example that shows what our method can do. It is PBD with a simple rigid body extension containing only a few lines of code. This remote controlled car contains hinges, spherical prismatic joints, hard and soft joint limits, friction and two-way coupling with soft bodies. If you wanted to include soft body coupling in the equations on the first slide, things would get even more involved. So what's the trick? In essence, a rigid body is almost as simple as a particle. The only difference is that it also has an orientation and an angular velocity. And when you apply a force, it changes the linear and the angular velocity. 99% of the complexity of rigid body formulations comes from using global solvers. We use a local solver and fix the slower convergence rate with substepping. A global solver handles all constraints at once. A local solver like Gauss Seidel iterates through the constraints one by one. Despite their slower convergence, local solvers make your life much easier. Here is a list of challenges for global solvers. The study of these challenges fills books. The first is complementarity, basically treating inequalities. These arise in contact simulations. With a local solver, handling inequalities can be done with a single if statement, basically testing each condition separately and only project if the condition is met. This also increases the accuracy because the active set is updated much more frequently. Checking whether a st static or dynamic friction applies can also be done with a single if statement. Because we update the constraint directions after each constraint solve, we get perfectly round friction cones. This is a challenge for global solvers. The problem of geometric stiffness is not an issue for us because we do not linearize the equations. Using substepping removes the numerical damping that global solvers typically have. As I said before, Introducing soft body coupling makes the already complex equations for global solvers even more complicated. For us, rigid body coupling with soft bodies does not even require special treatment because we do rigid body simulation within the position-based dynamics framework. As a local solver, we use nonlinear projected Gauss silo. To the best of our knowledge, this method is unique to position-based dynamics. This simple example shows how it works. So let's assume we have three points, P1, P2, and P3. P1 and P2 are attached to the floor. We also have two constraints. The first constraint says that the distance between P3 and P1 should be L1, and the second says that the distance between P3 and P2 should be L2. This is a nonlinear problem. A global solver first freezes the constraint directions, 
to make the problem linear. Then a global linear method such as conjugate gradients is used to solve the linear problem. This way the approximate red point is found. This is why multiple linearizations are necessary. So in addition to the conjugate gradient loops, multiple outer loops are necessary as well. And to guarantee stability, line search has to be used. The projected gauss seidel method typically used in game engines also operates on the linearized problem by solving for velocities. With nonlinear projected gauss seidel we first move P3 towards P1 to satisfy the first constraint. Then we use the constraint direction from the updated position and move the position towards P2 to satisfy the second constraint and iterate. This way nonlinear projected gauss seidel works on the nonlinear problem directly because the constraint directions are always updated immediately. As I mentioned before, to increase the convergence rate of our local solver, we use substepping. Substepping is not simply about decreasing the time step size. Here we have a simulation that uses a time step of delta t. Within each step, we run n substeps, and for each substep, we use m solver iterations. For games or other in interactive applications, or often offline simulations too, the time budget of the gray part is fixed. This budget is proportional to n times m. There are multiple choices for n and m and a fixed b, of course. One extreme case is to set n to 1 and m to b. This means we only use one substep and spend all the time we have to solve the equations. This is a standard way also used in position-based dynamics. The surprising fact is that the optimal choice concerning convergence rate and therefore accuracy is to perform as many substeps as possible and only solve the equations approximately. This lets our solver converge like global solvers. A nice side effect is that substepping also removes numerical damping and shows high frequency details. To demonstrate this, we created a chain of 100 bunnies. The first one is attached to the ceiling, and each bunny is attached to the one above. We first simulate this with one substep and 20 iterations. This way, the chain gets really stretchy. With 20 substeps and only one iteration, the stretchiness is almost completely gone. The difference is truly amazing. The next example shows the temporal detail we can resolve before the coin comes to rest. Of course, there's a large body of work on rigid body simulation. But to the best of our knowledge, the only work that uses position-based dynamics and therefore nonlinear projected gauss seidel is the work of Doyle and colleagues. However, they do not use our simple projections. They only support simple attachments, no general joints or joint limits, and also they only support hard constraints. To explain our method in more detail, we start with the traditional position-based dynamics method. For simplicity without substepping, because substepping can be added trivially. So we have n particles, and the first thing we do is we store the current positions as previous positions. Then we add external forces to the velocities explicitly. Next, we integrate the positions with a simple Euler step. After this, we solve for the new positions using our local solver. Finally, we update the velocities using the previous positions. We also run a velocity solve this is not important here. Please have a look at the paper for the details. So now let's see how we can extend this method to also handle rigid bodies. So far we only worked with particles. A particle has a position, a velocity and a mass. We can see a rigid body as an extended particle. In addition to the particle, a body also has an orientation which we store as a quaternion, an angle of velocity which is a vector and an inertia tensor which is a 3x3 three three matrix that can be pre-computed. It corresponds to the mass in rotational terms. 
Now we have to update these quantities as well. This can be achieved by a few lines of additional code. We also have to solve for both now the positions and the orientations of the bodies. For this, we introduce two simple projection types. But let's first have a look at the traditional distance constraint between two particles. In this case, we have two particles and the constraint distance. PBD solves this constraint by moving the particles toward each other. In order to conserve momentum, they have to be moved proportional to their inverse masses. For rigid bodies, the distance constraint can now be applied to off-center positions of the bodies. We can define them by local vectors R1 and R2. To solve for the constraint, both the positions as well as the orientations have to be adjusted now. To conserve momentum, these corrections are applied proportional to a combination of their inverse mass and inverse inertias. It is important to note that there is only one way to do this correctly in order to get correct physical behavior. For rigid body simulation, we need a second type of constraint. This type restricts the relative orientations of the two bodies. In this particular case, we want the orientations to be aligned. To achieve this, we have to apply updates to both orientations. Again, there's only one way to do this correctly in order to get the correct physical behavior. Let us now have a look at the equations for the projections of our two new constraints. We derived these equations from rigid body dynamics in the paper. For a distance constraint, we need the attachment locations R1 and R2 in global coordinates, the constraint direction N and the constraint distance C. First, we compute the generalized inverse masses of the two bodies. Then we compute the scalar Lagrange multiplier lambda. This is where the physical time step independent inverse stiffness is included. What's nice about using inverse stiffness, also called compliance, is that we can stably simulate hard constraints by setting it to zero. Given lambda, we can now update both the positions and the orientations of the two bodies. Omitting the red terms recovers the simple projection of a particle distance constraint. If we omit the red terms for only one body, we get the equations to attach a particle to a rigid body. This allows us to couple soft and rigid bodies. Let me now give you a few examples of how the new projection types can be used to implement a rigid body engine. The paper contains the complete list. For a zero length attachment, we set n to be the direction from one attachment point to the other in global coordinates. The constraint distance is set to be the distance between the two attachment points. For a non-zero attachment, you simply set c to be the difference between the current and the rest length. For hard attachment, we set the compliance of alpha to be zero and for a spring, we set it to the inverse of the stiffness of the spring. For a contact, we set n to be the contact normal and c to be the penetration depth, and we project only if c is larger than zero. To handle static friction is easy too. We simply treat the contact as an attachment, but only project if lambda is smaller then the lambda we used for the contact times the static friction coefficient. To simulate a hinge joint, we want to align the body axis A1 and E2 of two bodies. This is now an orientation constraint. Here we set n and phi to the direction and the length of the cross product of the two axes. I will now show a few examples of our rigid body engine in action. In this example, we show that we get the physically correct forces, elongations and oscillations with our method. This simulation of a triple pendulum shows how well energy is conserved with sub-stepping.
In this example, we show that our method can also be used to perform inverse kinematics. The user drags and rotates the gray box and the robot follows its motion. Our solver has no problems with over-constrained situations or with the redundant degrees of freedom of the robot. The simulation of this rolling ball sculpture shows how well our method handles fast-moving objects colliding against curved geometry. Thank you for your attention.